what a joy to be in the house of the Lord with you this morning. You know, someone told me, said, Pastor, you always say it's a joy or you're how happy. I am like David in that sense. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. I, I get thrilled to go to God's house. Had someone say, well, yeah, you have to, you're a pastor. Let me tell you something, long before I was pastoring, I was happy, I was full of joy to go into God's house with God's people, to be in the presence of the Lord. There is something refreshing. There is something renewing. There is something wonderful when you come into God's house expecting and receive a touch from him. I don't know how people make it without him. I don't know how people go week to week without going to church. I tell you what, I, I enjoy being in the house of the Lord. Amen? Give the Lord another hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. We're so thankful for all that God is doing in our midst. So thankful that you are a part of it and excited about what God is doing, all that's taking place. As you see on announcements, there's many things coming up. A lot that's happening. We're moving forward. Easter's just around the corner. This year we're looking for God to do some great and mighty things. And you're going to see that we're going to be pushing and promoting Easter a little bit different this year. We're starting, going to start early. I'm starting even before they do. And uh, we're going to be po po promoting and pushing it in a unique way this year. Did you know more people are one to Lord and come to church between January 1 and Easter than any other time of the year? The greatest time to reach people is leading up to Easter. And more people will be in church on Easter Sunday than any other day of the year. The second most affiliated day with church is Mother's Day. Easter and Mother's Day are two days you have more people come to church than any other. Than any other holiday or anything. And more people will hear the message of Jesus Christ leading up to Easter than any other time. And people are, for whatever reason, people are more acceptable acceptable to receive the message of Jesus prior to Easter than any other time. Can't explain it. I'm just telling you what statistics tell us. And I want to tell you something, church. I'm praying this year <laughs> that lost souls, that prodigals, that people who have gone become indifferent with God will find their way back home this Easter. I believe God's going to do something wonderful, and I'm excited and looking forward to it. Pastor, it's still over a month away. It's not too soon. It's not too early to start praying and saying, God, my loved one, my son, my daughter, my grandchild, my brother, sister, my mom, dad, whoever, that person I know that needs you, this could be the Easter. This could be the year that new birth could come into them again. That you could, just as we celebrate your resurrection on Easter Sunday, we can celebrate you rising again in their lives. Amen. So I want you to be much in prayer. Get locked in and participate. I want to tell you, if you're, if you're not participating, if you're not locked in, get locked in. If you're not on the Remind, see one of my staff, get hooked up on the Remind app so we can send you messages. Hey, we don't bother you, but I want to tell you, it'll let you know what's going on. And if you don't have the app, Listen, I don't, have to, I don't even know how to use half the stuff, but even I have the app. If you don't have the app, get it and share it with your friends and family. You know, it's amazing to me. I don't get on Facebook very often. I share a Facebook page with my wife, and uh, she has to tell me when there's messages and things and remind me because I just am not a, I'm not a Facebooky person. But I am amazed that when I do click on Facebook, there are a pile of you on it. I was shocked. And some of y'all are on it a lot. I mean, I get like, I was going through and we got all these notifications. Like, what in the world is this? And I started hitting them. And they, some of you pasted like a hundred things on there before I found the first one. You know, if we can talk about everything else, Facebook about what God is doing in the church and in your life. If you can tell everybody about everything else, I mean, I get pictures of people eating food, a picture of their plate going, and I'm like, oh boy, they went out to eat. 
pictures of their dogs. The dog's sitting there looking at them, and it's like, look what, look what Fluffy did. Okay. Pictures of their children. Now, that one I can understand, and grandchildren, because I like that. Because mine pops up. I got an app on mine that every day it tells me last year today, it pops up pictures of my family and friends and shows me what happened that day. I like that. Pictures of their vehicles. <clears throat> Someone put pictures of their vehicles like you wouldn't believe. I won't call them names, Robert and Eddie, but, you know, they got a lot of pictures of their vehicles. Some of you even put pictures of work. And I got to thinking, my Lord, if you can FaceTime about your work, you surely ought to be able to FaceTime about the church and what God is doing in your life. Amen? Come on. So why don't you try sharing today what Jesus does in your life. Maybe share what's going on in church. Share and invite somebody. Get ready for Easter and see what God will do in your life and your families. Amen? I hope I get some of those there Facebook messages or notifications. I look on there and see some of you sharing the church in Jesus. Amen? I think it'd be wonderful. This morning, I want to give you an opportunity to worship and give in your tithes and your offerings unto the Lord. I'm so thankful for this opportunity. Someone told me, said, Pastor, we need to do tithe and offering better. I actually have someone tell me, said, it disrupts the flow of the Spirit. I was shocked. I said, giving your tithes and your offerings disrupts the flow of the Spirit. Yeah, when God's moving and you give people to take up tithes and offerings, that just puts a damper on the whole thing. I said with love, I said, I love you, but you need to pray. Because if giving in your tithes and offerings disrupts the flow of spirit for you, then your spirit's not flowing right. Because one of the greatest things you can do in worship is give your tithes and offerings. Whenever you can't give it in worship, that means it's got too much of a hold on you. But when you can give it in worship and it doesn't hinder your flow of the spirit, it doesn't hinder your worship, it doesn't hinder what God's doing for you, I want to tell you, then you'll realize God will bless you because you are giving according to God's Word. You're giving from your heart. You know what God told the children of Israel? He said, let all of those such as have a willing heart come and give their tithes and offerings. He said, bring it into my storehouse and see if I will not bless them. And when Moses gave the command, the Bible didn't say everybody came. The didn't, Bible didn't say everybody gave. But the Bible said, and such as of, were of a willing heart, they came and gave unto the Lord. <laughs> but right after that, it said, and the Lord God blessed his people. Give unto the Lord and let him bless you. Would you pray with me this morning as we prepare our hearts to give? Father, I thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. I thank you for this opportunity we have to worship and give unto you. Father, I don't give a tithes and offerings just to be given to a man or an organization. But I, I give it and worship unto you, for it is yours. And I give to your kingdom that you may bless me, Father. And Father, I pray that you would bless your people today as they worship and giving, as they're obedient to your name. And let your presence be felt as we worship and giving this morning. We ask it all in Christ Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Worship in your giving. Hallelujah. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want you to open with me to the book of John. I want to speak to you for just a few moments on spoken. Spoken. So you can have peace. God's Word is full of things that God spoke directly to His people. But this one is spoken more often through the Bible than any other. When you begin to study, you'd be surprised at how much God speaks on this subject. I'm going to ask you if you would to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. In St. John chapter 14, I'm going to go from 14, read about four, three verses, and then read a couple of verses from John 16. In John 14, verses 25 through 27, listen to what Jesus says. 
these things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. Verse 27. Peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. In John chapter 16, verse 1, and in then verse 33. In John chapter 16, verse 1, these things I have spoken to you. Notice this, that you should not be made to stumble. That you should not be made to stumble. Verse 33. These things I have spoken to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. <laughs> I want to read that one again. These things I have spoken to you that in me, somebody look at your name and tell them in Jesus. He said in me that you may have peace in this world, in this life that we're living now. You will have tribulation. We don't want to hear that. It's not that it's not a maybe or an if. He said in this life, in this world, you will have tribulation. But I'm glad he didn't stop there, church. I'm glad he just didn't end it there. He let us know we're going to struggle. We're going to be stressed out. We're going to have tribulation. But he said, but be of good cheer. Pastor, it's hard to be of good cheer when you're stressed, when you're in tribulation. Be of good cheer. Because even though you may have tribulation, he said, I have, I have, I have, listen to me church, he didn't say I'm going to, he didn't say I might, he didn't say maybe, he didn't say I hope, he said I have already overcome the world. I have overcome the world. <laughs> Glory to God. Pray with me. Father, I thank you right now because I know that you have already overcome this world. And Father, for I see that you have already spoken to us. Father, you have spoken to us that we may have understanding, that we may know that we would not be made to stumble, Father, that we can have your peace in a world of tribulation because you have spoken it to us. So Father, I praise you today for that and I speak peace into every heart that is here. I speak peace into every life. And you spirit of heaviness right now, I rebuke you and bind you in the name of Jesus. And I speak peace into the life of every person under the sound of my voice in this building and those watching live, Father. I speak peace to them right now in Jesus' name. We praise you for it. And everyone said, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of of the Lord. As we were, <laughs> you know, this is funny because I can tell you, my wife had no clue what God had put into my heart to preach. She'll tell you, I, I, I heart, won't really tell people what I'm, God's put in my heart. They'll get a scripture, they'll get a title and some notes, but I won't tell them what I'm going to preach. I just, it's very rare. And right before service, I, I'll be honest with you, while I go, I asked my wife, I said, Am I okay? Because she was giving me that look. And I was like, did I do something wrong? I was making sure I'm okay. 
And she said, no. She said, no, she's just such a heaviness. And I well, I know that. She said, there's a heaviness. You know, there's so many things going on right now in some people's lives. There's been deaths. There's been uh, tragedies and situations that have took place. And it was funny because when she was speaking that, God had already put this in my heart, and this was my message for the day, spoken so you can have peace. Spoken so you can have peace. I want you to fill in the blank with me for just a moment. I'll take just a moment, but I want you to fill in the blank if you know this. I'm going to just say up something I want you to fill in the blank. I'm ready to throw in the, I'm at the end of my, I am a bundle of, no, my life is falling, I'm at my wits, I'm about to come un, I feel like, Resigning from the human grace. Well, I hope you're human anyway. That's the only thing you can resign from. How many of you ever made those statements before? Hmm. Did you know <laughs> the American Psychiatric Association says that people who make these statements on a weekly basis is a symptom and sign that they are suffering from undue amounts of stress in their life. What are the symptoms of stress? The number one symptoms of stress in America today, think about this if you have them, difficulty breathing, panic attacks, blurry-eyed or sore-eyed. Blurry-eyed, sore-eyes. How about this one? Sleep problems or restless sleep. Excuse me, chronic fatigue, muscle aches, chronic headaches, chest pains, <laughs> chronic heartburn, mm -hmm. high blood pressure, muscle aches, indigestion, anxiety or nervousness, anger or irritability, feelings of being overwhelmed. You feel any of those things? Have you felt any of those things this week? Would you be surprised that you know that 85% of the Americans today confess that they have problems with anger and irritability? 40% of Americans today say they are anxious and nervous during the week on their jobs or with their families. Stress. Stress can be defined as any type of change that causes a physical, emotional, or psychological strain. It is a constraining force that influences uh, our stress as a feeling of emotion or physical tension. It can come from any event through our thought and make you feel frustrated, angry, or nervous. It causes a physical, chemical, and emotional factor to cause the body to have mental uh, tension. Great worry caused by difficulty of the situation or sometimes uh, it's the call, what is causing the condition. In fact, the American Psychiatric Association said 79% of the heart attacks in America today are caused from stress, 79% of them. 88.7%, listen to this, uh, suicides are stress-related. 91.4% of all divorces come because of overstress in the marriage. Wow. wow. Did you hear those things? Stress. Stress is one of the leading factors of social breakdown within families and communities. Stress. It affects not only the human body. It causes us to have emotional damage. It causes our body to have weakness, and we are more susceptible to uh, common colds and other sicknesses. Stress often gets into a marriage, and it is the number one leading of destruction of marriage. It affects our relationships with our children. It affects the relationships with other family members, our employees. It affects us, our relationship with our friends, our neighbors, and those around us. It is one of the largest destroyers of relationships in the world today. Stress. And people are under undue amounts of it all around. In fact, it is one of the highest leading causes of all medical conditions today. They say stress affects the body like nothing else. And stress is spreading. It seems like it's becoming more prevalent even at a younger age in lives of children. They are stressed. They're 
stressed with school. They're stressed with fitting in. Uh, they, they try to they gotta belong to the group, uh, how they are socialized and how they're accepted and how they're recognized in this world today. And people are under so much stress. Uh, but Bible says in Proverbs 14 and 30, a tranquil or peaceful heart is life to the body, but stress is the rottenness of the bones. Uh, can I tell you today, the Bible tells me about stress, uh, but it also tells me about peace. In fact, uh, the Bible tells me that what to do about stress in my life and how to handle stress in my life. God says we need peace in our lives, uh, and I'm so thankful today that he spoke it so that we could have peace in the stress of our lives today and everything that we're going through and everything that we're facing that he could touch us. Now, I want you to understand something. I want you to make note of this. There are three types of peace talked about in the Bible, three types of peace in the Bible. And when you study the Word of God, you will find them. Number one, there is peace with God. Listen to me, peace with God. This is an upward and spiritual peace. And it's according to Romans 5, 1 through 5, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have access by faith into the grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. But not only that, we also glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So the first kind of peace he tells us we need is peace with God. That peace that comes through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The second type of peace he says we need is the peace of God. Peace of God. You need peace with God and you need the peace of God. That is emotional and inward peace. This second kind of peace the Bible talks about, you can find it in Colossians 3, 15 through 17. Let the peace of God rule your hearts, to which also you were called in one body to be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and demolishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father the Father through him. You know, we were just doing that singing and hymns and singing uh, uh, songs of praise and psalms, uh, uh, spiritual songs, worship. Why? Because we want peace of God. I don't just want peace with God. I want the peace of God. And the peace of God comes whenever I am in his presence. Glory to God. When I am with him, when I am in touch with him and his presence is touching me. Listen to me. I get the peace with God because of salvation but I get the peace of God when I am worshiping, when I am standing in his word, when I am in his presence. It is a peace that gives me strength day to day. And the third kind of peace the Bible talks about is found in Romans 12. It is peace with others. It is external peace. This is probably the largest cause of stress in our lives today. It is produced by relationships. We have in our lives. And when our relationships with other people are out of order, it can produce some of the greatest stress you will ever know. When the marriage relationship is out of order, it produces incredible stress. When the parent-child relationship is out of order, when the boss and employee relationship is out of order, when uh, your neighbor's relationship is out of order, when the friends you have, that relationship is out of order, all of these begin to produce stress in our lives. And you know why? Because so many times uh, we are so worried about pleasing others uh, and fitting in with others uh, and making others happy when we ought to be thinking about pleasing God and fitting in with God. Can somebody say amen? It's amazing. Uh, the American Psychiatric Association says uh, that 97.3% of children from the age of 12 to 16 uh, are in great stress relationship environments because they are they have to fit in with the group and the crowd. They have to make a like be like them to be popular, to be accepted, and it causes undue stress on them, especially if the parents, uh, listen, especially if the parents have said, 
children are not giving them an understanding of how to break free from that stress. They worry over their friends liking them. They worry over being popular. They worry over what somebody's going to think about them. Young people today, they dress to be cool. They want to look like others. They do the same hairstyles. They'll try to dress the same way. They try to fit in and they'll find their social groups. And that's why when you find them, you'll find all these different groups in the school. You got the, uh, you got the smart ones, uh, the ones everybody calls the geeks or the nerds. Uh, then you got those that are uh, over here on the other side that are the jocks. Uh, then you got those that are the rich kids that are real popular. You got the smart kids. Uh, you got those that don't care that's uh, in the gothic group and all that. And you find kids going from one or the other group trying to find a place to fit in. And when they find a group that will accept them, they'll begin to look like that group. Uh, they'll begin to act like that group. They'll begin to walk and talk like that group. Why? because all they want is someone to accept them so they won't be under the stress they're in. They get out of high school and go to college and they find themselves trying to fit in with the different frat groups. Oh, they got to be in this sorority or this group. They got to fit in with that group. The young men and young ladies go in there and their teachers are teaching them a, a bunch of garbage that is contrary to the word of God. Let me tell you something today. Higher education may be needed and I encourage you to get it. I I encourage you to study to have a better job but let me tell you something a lot of the garbage they're teaching in higher education it in higher education it's dumbing down the world to what God said and what God wants them to know and our young men and women are feeling pushed into areas to accept teachings that are contrary to the word of God to accept damnable doctrines and things that would have never been taught before today to fit in they're, they're having to socialize they're having to blind their eyes to things that they know are wrong and saying, well, they're that way. It's okay. Well, you don't know what gender you are. Be what gender you want to be. You don't know what you need. Do whatever you want to do. You're your own person. And it's blind in the minds of our young men and women today in our universities and colleges because they're trying to find a place to fit in. And the social stress that is on them is causing them to accept things they should not accept and to do things they should not do. All oh, the peer pressure, come out and have a drink with me. Uh, come out and have a little jolt with me. Uh, oh, you can take this, it'll make you feel good. It'll carry your worries away. And they feel pressured uh, and they're under such stress uh, that they're making choices uh, that are destroying their lives. Uh, and moms and dads, our marriages are falling apart. Uh, homes are being broken. Why? Because the enemy has brought stress uh, from every situation and come in and attacked uh, from every group. Uh, in our church alone. Two families in here in the last two or three weeks have, or three have already experienced three different suicides. They weren't directly related to the church, but people in my church either worked with them or were friends with them or knew them. Not only that, several have had unexpected deaths, tragedies that have come into their lives, and they see the pressures of stress that is all around. My Lord, it's easier to go to work than to talk to your wife about that problem. It's easier to send us kids to school than to deal with that behavior problem. It's easier to turn a blind eye because of all the stress that the enemy has brought upon the church. But I've come to tell somebody today that God is sick and tired of his people being so stressed out that they cannot follow him. It's time we get in the word of God and realize we've got a God above that wants to take away your stress and give you some peace. Yes, you're going to have tribulations. Yes, you're going to have problems. Yes, the enemy's going to fight, but I got good news for you. Let the devil raise his ugly head. Let him do everything he can. My God has already overcome this world and the devil. Glory to God. There's nothing he can do to destroy you if you will let the peace of God be in your life. Pastor, that's easy said. That's hard to do. Oh, no, it's not. The Bible says we can acquire God's perfect peace. Now, let me tell you something. First off, let me, let me say something. Peace is not the absence of stress. Peace is not the absence of conflict. Peace is not the absence 
of problems. That's worldly peace. And it's fleeting. It's fragile. It doesn't last. See, the devil wants you to think if you've got peace, that means everything is right and nothing's going wrong. And he has sold the church a bill of goods that says, if everything is right in your life, you don't have peace, and you're in turmoil, and your life's a mess, and there's something wrong with you. But I got good news for you. Jesus tells me I'm in warfare. Jesus tells me that if I'm really all right, there's a struggle going on. Oh, I don't want to struggle, Pastor. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. No, I want everything to be happy. I want everything to be good. I, I don't want any problems. Well, let me tell you something. If that's what you want, you won't make it to heaven because that means the devil's already got you. But if you're on your way to heaven, if you're trying to live right and do right, the devil's going to target you and try to stop you and try to destroy you and try to tear you down and try to wear you down. So if you're having stress and problems, you need to look up. That means that God is working in your life and the devil doesn't like it and the devil's trying to get you off of, off of what God's got for you. The devil's trying to get you to turn your eyes away from him and look down and give up and quit and whine and cry. But God's saying, listen, it, uh, listen, they hated me also. It's okay. I, they, uh, they abused me also. It's okay. They crucified me, but guess what? I'm alive again. I, you may think they're going to destroy you, but the devil's not going to destroy you. What's happening in your life is going to make you stronger. It's going to make you better. And in the end, if you've got Jesus on the inside, working on the outside, if you do die, you'll be resurrected again. Glory to God. My Lord. But you see, we got to acquire it. Well, Pastor, listen to what the Bible said. I read it to you in the Scripture. John 14, verses 25. These things I have spoken to you. God spoke to you. Well, he was talking to the disciples. He was talking to the children of God. He was talking through the word. How many of you are saved by grace this morning? Okay, I'm a little worried. I am really a little worried. Only about a third of the people raised their hand, and only about, ain't even a quarter of them said amen. Either you don't know if you're saved, and that's not good. You're not saved, that's really not good. Are you saved? And if you're saved, you ought to know you're saved. And if you're saved, you ought to be glad you're saved. So if somebody says, if you're asked if you're saved, it shouldn't be go, oh, yeah. It ought to be, yeah, amen, I'm saved, thank God. Because if you're not saved, you're going to hell. Oh, no, I'm not going to go there. But yeah, you are. If you're not saved and washed in the blood of the Lamb, if you haven't asked Jesus to come into your heart, you're on your way to a devil's hell. You're going to bust hell wide open. There won't be no party there. There ain't going to be no joy there. There's weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, honey. Everybody in the hell wants to get out. Everybody, I'm going to tell you something. The greatest revival you'll ever have in the world will be in hell because everybody wants to know Jesus when they get there. So either you're going up or you're going down. And if you're not sure which, it's probably down. So I asked you again, is there anyone here saved this morning? At least that was better. I want to tell you something. You shouldn't have to think about it. You shouldn't have to wonder. You ought to know if you're saved. Hmm, glory to God. This ain't in my nose, but I'm going to tell you something. You ain't going to have peace with God if you're not saved. I said, you're not going to have peace with God if you're not saved. He said, these things I've spoken to you. But look what else he said. But the helper, the Holy Spirit, he said, the Holy Ghost whom my Father will send in my name. He will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I have said to you. Let me tell you, God, Jesus said, I'm going away. But I'm going to send you another comforter, the Holy Spirit. And he's coming from my Father. He is coming to the child of God, to the believer. And look at what he said. This Holy Spirit is coming. He's 
said, Jesus said, I, peace I leave with you. My peace I give you, but not as the world gives do I give it unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Well, pastor, you don't know what I'm going through. I know one thing. If you are saved by grace, yes, you may be having problems. Yes, you may be having difficulties. Yes, the enemy may be pouncing on you and fighting you every which way you turn, but you need to shake that stress off. You need to look up and say, I'm a child of God. I've been saved by grace. And Jesus said, I didn't have to be afraid. I didn't have to be worried. I didn't have to be beaten down. I don't have to be knocked down. I'm not going to be destroyed. I belong to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I've been saved by grace. My name's been written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. I'm on my way to glory. I got Jesus living on the inside, working on the outside. Devil, you ain't got no hold on my life. Peace of God. Let's see. You see, there are three key principles. I'm going to be quick. But there are three key principles to getting peace. You need to write these down. You need to underline this in your scriptures. Or you need to remember it really good. Because some of us ain't doing it. You know why we ain't got peace? Three principles according to the word of God that you got to do to have the peace with God, the peace of God, <laughs> and peace with others. Listen to what he said. Number one, obey. Somebody say obey. Somebody told me, said, Pastor, <laughs> I had a lady one time. This really happened. I had a lady one time, church I was pastoring, wasn't here. And uh, she told me, I got to preach on obedience. And I said, obey. She said, I don't say that word. I don't obey my husband. When we got married, I told the pastor, in our vows, he better not say to obey. Because I wasn't saying to obey. I don't obey nobody. And all I can think is, thank God you ain't mine. I'm being honest with you. Glory to God. I prayed, I started praying more for her husband than I'd ever prayed for him in my life. I felt like he needed it. Some of you think obey is a four-letter word. Some of y'all get that in a minute. Some of y'all didn't even understand that. My daughter can teach you. She's a math genius and English genius. She can teach you. Obey is a four-letter word. You'll get it eventually. And some of us don't like to hear it. You know, we struggle to obey. Oh, I don't struggle to obey. Yeah, you do. If you just said, if you just thought in your mind, because I know somebody, I don't have a problem obeying. You need to come to altar and repent so you can go to heaven. Because I'm telling you right now, if that's what you thought, you're probably going to hell. You can't say that. Yeah, I am. Listen to me. Obey. How many of you remember when you were a child? You always obeyed, right? Mm -hmm. Come on. It starts when you're young. A spirit, an attitude of rebellion, hello, and not listening. Come on. I found out something. You can't obey if you won't listen. Come on. And kids, <laughs> glory to God, even the perfect ones like my grandkids don't obey all the time. Why? Because they don't want to listen. In fact, the other day they were with me, and, and uh, little Judah was having a moment, to, and what it was, he needed some rest time, and he didn't want rest time. And my wife come in there, and she talked to him in that voice that said the other woman was about to come out. And when she talked to him in that voice, he looked at me, what do I do? I said, you didn't obey. You got to obey. You got to listen and let me tell you, when that other voice come out, he decided it was time to obey. Believe me, you don't want to meet the other one. This is a good one. The other one. 
No, no, no. The children knew because when she comes out, that's when Nana gets the paddle. That's when Nana will get in, they get in trouble, glory to God. And when Nana finally gets to that point, she said, okay, that's it. Glory to God, they realize. And Judah goes, no, 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 I, I'm listening now. I, I'm listening real good now because he's the same way with my son. And my son says that to him, and he don't want to listen, but all of a sudden, and he gets that from his mama. The other side of him will come out. And, and when that other side of him, they don't get it from me. I'm a good guy. The other side of him comes out. Glory to God. Judah's going, no, 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 Daddy. I, I'll listen now. Why? But it's too late then. You're already in trouble. Punishment has already arrived. You know what's wrong with the church today? We're not listening and we're not obeying God anymore. We need to get back to the Word of God. We need to quit walking around like we're already in heaven. I got news for you. They ain't none of us made it yet. And we need to hear and obey the principles of God's Word and live according to God's Word. Can somebody say man oh pastor that's not in the Bible I'm so glad you said that in Isaiah 48 and 18 oh if you had only listened to my commands then you would have peace flowing like a gentle river and righteousness rolling over you like the waves of the sea but you have not listened or nor obeyed my word listen to me you got to listen and obey. Psalms 119, 165, great peace. Have those who love your law and have nothing causes and nothing causes them to stumble. We need to obey the principles of God. John 16 and 1, these things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble. Honey, if you have the word of God, the stress of this life, the worries of this life, the problems of the, I don't care how much stress you got on me on you if you will obey his word it won't cause you to stumble he said I've spoken these things to you that you be not made did you hear that made to stumble sometimes we can stumble on our own but the enemy sends stress on us to make us stumble he wants us so stressed out that we don't know which way we're going come on some of you ever said this I don't know if I'm coming or going today I happen to know three people in here today, that, that, this week, that made that statement. Hello, and what, my family. Some of you go, Pastor, I don't know whether I'm coming or going right now. You're so stressed with work. You're so stressed with finances. You're so stressed with the, your health or situation going on. And you get up in the morning and you feel like you just, I don't know if I'm coming or going. Well, let me tell you, what you need to do is listen and obey God's word. Well, Pastor, I am being a good Christian. I'm obeying God's word. Listen to me. Listen and obey God's principles. In John, third, uh, John excuse me, third John chapter 4, verse 17, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Uh, excuse me, that was in James 4, 17. In 3 John uh, 1 and 11 says, Beloved, do not be do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. For he who does good in of God, but he who does evil is not has not seen God and does not know him. In Leviticus 26, he said, after all this, if you do not obey me, but walk contrary to me, then I will walk contrary to you in fury. Let me tell you something. What do you mean, pastor? I'm obeying God's word. Well, if you're obeying God's principles, the next thing you got to do is focus on God. God's presence. You see the two, three key facts about having peace. Number one, obey his principles. How do I obey his principles? By reading your word, by praying and walking according to what he wants me to do. But after I'm doing that, I've got to do something else. i got to focus on God's presence. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. That in me, he said, you may have peace. The second key to experiencing God's peace is not only walking in God's principles, but daily focusing on his presence. Did you get up and start your day with Jesus this morning? Did you start your day with Jesus every day of your life? If you're not starting your way with Jesus, honey, you're not God in his presence. I'm too late. I got to hurry. I got too much to do. You need to take time to pray. You need to take time to read a scripture, get a devotion or do something. You need to take time to find God's presence in your life every day. And when you find your life coming unglued, and you don't know if you're coming or going. You just need to stop 
and get in his presence. You need to stop where you're at. You need to stop what you're doing. You need to stop where you're going and say, God, let me take a minute and invite you into my heart today. Let me invite you into my presence today because I know that you inhabit the praises of your people. And when you begin to worship him and praise him, the peace of God will come down into your presence, into your life. And all of a sudden, you won't be going, I don't know where I'm coming or going. You'll know where you're going. You'll know what you need to do because the peace of God will surround you and carry you through. We need to get in his presence. My Lord. You know, sometimes you just need to stop everything else. Look at your neighbor and say, stop. Look at the one that's asleep and say, wake up and stop. Stop. You know, that's not a bad word. That's another four-letter word. But you can say it. Stop. You know, sometimes it's okay to stop. Stop your hectic life for a moment and get with God. Pastor, I'm on the job, and my boss will get mad if I stop and pray. Let me tell you something. If you, hello, can't keep punching a button, answering a phone, or doing whatever you're doing, and in your head say, Jesus, I need to get in your presence right now. Hello? And how many of you, let me ask, how many of you get a break on your job? So none of y'all eat lunch. None of y'all can stop and get a Coke, but one person in my church, only one person gets a break on their job. Either, boy, y'all go, we all come into the altar this morning, glory to God. Because some of y'all, y'all ain't telling the truth. I don't get paid for it. I didn't ask you that. Side. How many of you get a break on your job? How many of you, when you need to stop and get a glass of water? All right, glory to God, Justin, we finna have revival. Click, get ready. Y'all not going to go to the bathroom no more during service. Because y'all don't get breaks on your job. So if you can work eight hours without going to the restroom, you ought to be, set through, be able to sit through 45 minutes of my preaching without going to the bathroom three times. Somebody give a hand clap of praise because that's good preaching. Some of us will go to the restroom at the beginning of the service. Some of us will go to the restroom at offering time. Some of us will go to the restroom at the last song is strong and I get up here to preach. And some of us will go through the restroom 15 minutes into my preaching. Some of us will go to the restroom when I say it's time to close. And some will go to the restroom when I bring Justin up here because I always close when I say it's time to close. Hello? But evidently you don't get those on your job because you don't get no breaks. So you work eight hours without going to potty. So either you got a mighty good diaper or you wasn't telling the truth. Now let me ask you again, how many of you get a break on your job? Yes. And you know what happens? If you can take a break to go to the bathroom, if you can take a break to go to the water fountain or the soda machine, if you can just take a break because you just don't want to do nothing for about 10 minutes, uh, if you can take a break to eat lunch, uh, I want to tell you something. You can take a two-minute break, whatever you're doing, and call upon the name of the Lord and get God's presence in your life. That's what's wrong with the world today. We can break for everything else. We need to be breaking for God. We need to say, God, I need time with you. Because the only way you're going to get peace in your life is get in his presence. You see, David said, Isaiah, excuse me, said in Isaiah 26, you will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed upon you because he or she trusts in you, O Lord. Pastor, I can't think about God 24-7 like you. Listen to me, church. It's not about thinking about God 24-7. It's about when you need that moment that you stop and find them. Guess what he said? And I will be found by you when you search for me with your whole 
heart. Woo! Somebody give the Lord praise. And the third one, third last key, if you want God's peace in your life, if you really want God's peace in your life, you don't have to just be obedient, listen and be obedient to his principles. You don't just have to be in his presence, glory to God, but you got to trust. You got to have faith in his promises. Listen to me, church. Pastor, that's not scriptural. John 16, 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. But he didn't stop there. In this world you will have tribulations. But he didn't stop there. But be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. That is a promise. That is a promise. You got to have faith and believe. That if, listen to me. How many of you believe that Jesus was born of a virgin? If you don't, we'll talk after church. How many of you believe that Jesus was crucified on the cross and died? How many of you believe and know that on the third day he rose from the grave? Yes, sir. If you can believe that, you ought to be able to believe the promise that he says, I know you're going to have tribulation in this life, but you can cheer up. Be of good cheer means cheer up. Listen, understand, it's okay if you had tribulations. Cheer up because even in the middle of your stress, in the middle of your tri uh, tribulation, he said, I have already overcome the world. If you believe he was born of a virgin, if you believe he died on the cross, if you believe he rose on the third day, you ought to believe and have enough faith to say, you know what, God, if you did all of that, I know you've conquered this problem. I may be fighting the devil right now, but victory's already mine because you've already overcome the world. And if he's already overcome the world, he's already given us the victory. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him. Listen to me. It didn't end there. Listen to me. When you trust in the Lord with all your heart, you got to have faith. Don't lean to your own understanding. Honey, glory to God. What you hear and see may tell you it's bad. What you hear and see and think you know may seem like you can't get out of this situation. Don't lean. Don't trust your own understanding. Trust God. Don't lean to your own understanding. But acknowledge him. How do I acknowledge him? Get in his presence. Glory to God. And have faith. Because the Bible said, and he shall direct your path, your footsteps, where you're going. He's going to lead you through that problem. He's going to take care of it. Yeah, but pastor, I don't know if I can. Numbers 23. The children of Israel were struggling with these very concepts that we struggle with today. They were stressed. The enemy was coming to kill them. The enemy wanted to destroy them. They had no home. They had no place to go. They were in a wilderness. We're not going to make this. We're not going to survive. There's not enough water. There's not enough food. How we, the enemy is coming to kill us. How are we going to do it? My Lord, have mercy. We are not going to be able to go through this situation. The obstacles are around us are so great. They were stressed out. They were so messed up. They said, you know what? Let's kill Moses. And let's turn around and go back to Egypt. Better that we be slaves in Egypt than to die in the wilderness. They wanted to go back and die a slave than die in the wilderness because all they could see was the obstacles. All they could see was there was not enough to supply their needs. All they could see was the enemy coming to kill them. We got an enemy wants to kill us. There's no way to the right, no way to the left, no way forward. And even if we do get out of this, there's not any water for us to drink in this wilderness. There's not any food in this wilderness for us to eat. There is 
no way we can survive this. But God told them to stand still and trust him. In Numbers, he said this, I am not a man that I should lie, nor the son of man that I should repent. Have I not said and will I not do? Have I not spoken and will I not make it good? Can I tell you that if God said he'd keep you and bring you through it, you got to trust in his promises. you got to believe in him because there may not look like there's a way through, but God can part the Red Sea. There may not be enough water there, but God can bring water out of the rock. You may not have enough to eat, but God can give manna from heaven. Glory to God. What I'm trying to tell you is no matter what your situation is today and how stressed you are over it, you need to get back in the presence of God. You need to obey the principles of God and you need to trust in the promises of God and God will give you peace over your situation. Stand with me all over this house. There's a song. Mercy me sings. Even then. In that song in the verse it says, I know you said a little faith can move mountains. And I'm glad because right now I got little faith. In that song it says, I know you're able to take me through the fire and through the trial. But you know what I like about that song? What I really love about that song? Whoever wrote that song for them was writing from what they had experienced. But it says, but even if, even if, somebody look at your name and tell them, even if. It says, even if you don't. <laughs> Even if you, ah, whew. can I tell you what? You got to trust him. You got to believe in him. You got to look to him. Even when it doesn't work the way you think it should. Because you know he's able. And even if you don't, I'm going to still trust you, Lord. I'm going to still look to you. And can I tell you something? That's when the perfect peace of God comes into your life because here is the person perfect peace of high peace of God and let the peace of God <laughs> guard their hearts and their minds in Christ Jesus when you're in the midst of a battle when you're stressed out you're coming unglued you're overwhelmed. You don't know if you're coming or going. Your life's a mess and you just want to, you feel like you're at the end of your rope. That's the piece that'll let you tie a knot at the end of that rope and hold on longer than you ever thought you could hold on. That's the piece that'll come in and put you all back together when you've come unglued. That's the piece of God that when you feel like you're overwhelmed, will lift you up and set your feet on a solid rock and establish your goings and the enemy can come in like a flood. Glory to God. But it cannot touch you because that peace will be with you in the midst of your storm, in the midst of the fire, in the midst of the raging sea. That peace will step on your boat when you think it's about to go under and speak peace. Some of you this morning, if you will be honest, hey, I deal with stress all the time. My doctor told me part of my part of my problem, he said, is undue stress. I, everybody deals with it, but what do you do when you're stressed? Some of you this morning, you walked in here stressed out. Some of you got some situations going on in your life that you're so stressed over you don't know what you're doing. Some of you have dealt with loss and hurt and pain 
and it has stressed you. Let me tell you something. Obey the principle. Number one principle. Obey the principle of God. How do I do that? Back. Cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. Obey the principles. Number two, God, I want to get in your presence this morning. I can't put you in God's presence. When Moses saw the burning bush, it was burning. He saw it, but he didn't get into the presence till he went to see it. He said, I will now turn aside and see this bush that burns with fire and it's not burned. And when he got to the bush, God spoke to him. Brother Paul, God said, Moses, stop. Mo he didn't tell Moses to go away. He said, Moses, stop. Take off your shoes for the ground you stand is holy. You've gotten into my presence. But Moses had to go there. And when you get in his presence this morning, all you got to do is simply look up and say, Father, I believe in you and I trust your promises. I trust that you'll never leave me nor forsake me. I trust that you'll help me deal with this. I trust that you'll help me understand. I trust that you'll bring me through. I trust that you're going to give me your peace. And your peace is all I need to make it day in and day out. So those of you this morning who walked in here to stay stressed and don't feel bad because there'll be people who won't say it but they did too. But don't worry about them. If you've been dealing with some stress in your life and you want God to touch you this morning I want you to obey the principle. I want you to get in his presence and I want you to trust him. How do you do that pastor? Right now I want you to come. All you have to do is step out and come and meet me down here. I've been stressed, Pastor. I need God to bring some peace into my life. Come on. God bless you. I can't do it for you. Got to obey the principle yourself. I'm stepping out this morning. I want some peace. I want God to meet this need. I want God to give me some direction. I want God to move in my life. I want God to touch and bless. I'm going to get into his presence. And when I step into his presence, guess what? <laughs> All you got to do is, when you get here, we're going to pray. I can't do it for you, but you got to be willing to trust and believe. Hey, don't be looking for some lightning bolt, of, some magic trick or something like that. Obey his principle by coming. Get in his presence by submitting and worshiping and praying. And number three, trust, trust. In his promises. How many of you believe your car is going to crank up when you go out there and get in it? You do that by faith. You don't think about it. Have faith to what God promised you he's going to do. Come on, sister. Come on. I need some, I need some of my leaders to count. I need some prayer warriors this morning. We need to pray. <laughs> Glory to God.